There are a lot of frightening enemies in the Warhammer 40k universe, and one of the races that you definitely don't want to go up against is the Dark Eldar. These guys have advanced technology from the height of the Eldar Empire, and all of the horrible ideas on how to use it. They are masters in torture and pain, because the suffering of others is what gives them both satisfaction and vitality. So, when I was reading the book Silent Hunters, I was quite surprised from a particular moment, because the book is focused on the Space Sharks, a nomadic chapter of Space Marines that are known for their brutality. These guys were able to mentally break a Dark Eldar lieutenant. This wasn't a run-of-the-mill interrogation. No, no, no. They wanted more than just information. This was to make the Dark Eldar lieutenant serve them and willingly take them into the dark city of Kamara. This is one of my favourite moments from the book, and I wanted to share it with all of you. So, sit back and enjoy the story about how the Space Sharks were able to mentally break a Dark Eldar Dracon. It was the tedium that proved intolerable, the endless, numbing boredom. Confined to a featureless cell, with no conversations, no windows, and no diversions, Utak finally accepted the invitation that was written on the wall, Say when you are ready to talk. The dracon banged on the door of his cell, Silence. The whole damn vessel was silent. He was given food in silence. He could barely even hear his captors when they moved outside to deliver the meager offering of gruel pushed out using a paper rod. No one entered to remove his used plates, and all Utak had to relieve himself was a bucket that had not been emptied. Utak never thought that he would miss the dark city of Kamara, the endless diversions, amusements of every kind, and variety to enable the immortal Dark Eldar to endure the passage of hours, days, years, and even centuries. His thoughts lingered on the city with fondness, the views, the pleasure gardens, and the torture gardens of the endless city. He had tried to compose songs, but the state of consciousness he needed led to the descent of the poetic muse. The poor squalor and blank featureless walls had closed in around him, constricting his ability to craft the wondrous songs he would normally compose. Resist. He must resist his captors. Utak recited poems that he had memorized, danced striking poses of such exaggerated perfection that even the blank walls must have noticed. But they remained silent. Utak slumped onto the floor in dismay, asking himself, what is a dancer without an audience? In the end, Utak crumbled. He beated on the cell door, asking for conversation, distraction, even death would be preferable to the crushing boredom of his cell. As a Drukhari, there was nothing worse than stagnation. Three days had passed. There. No one could say that he had not gone beyond a point of reasonable resistance. Most Drukhari, he was sure, would have cracked in under twelve hours. 
Utak was bare and naked, but this had helped him to endure longer by being able to appreciate his own physical perfection. He wondered if the Monkai would be dazzled by the magnificence of his body. Yes, he would dazzle them with his beauty and stupefy them with his wit. Yes, let them open the door, and he shall greet them as a king would greet a member of his court, gracefully, magnanimously, and with a hint of veiled menace. The door slid back. Utak had adopted a suitably regal pose, which had him looking up towards the ceiling. He lowered his head slowly to meet his captors eye to eye, and at the same moment a jet of cold water from a high-pressure hose struck him in the chest, hurling him back across the cell and pinned him against the far wall. Gasping, spluttering, and all but deaf, he was held by the weight of the water until at last it finally stopped. His senses returned quickly, but he couldn't let this be known. His perfect hearing was able to discern the altered rhythm of two hearts. There were three Monkai outside his cell, waiting, but they were fundamentally different from the rest of their kind. Space Marines. Despite this, their kind only had one brain, and it was vastly inferior to his. While apparently lying limp and taking his time to recover, Utak was already assessing his chances of disabling his captors and escaping. The outcome was unacceptable. Even worse, it would likely be messy and undignified. Utak was a dracon of the Cabal of the Pierced Rose, and he fully intended that his end should be one to inspire poetry, song, and legend. Instead, he wiped the dirty water from his lips and stated, If you wanted to wash the cell, you merely had to ask, but I will not hold it against you. The Dracon gave the most minimal of gestures, the kind an aristocrat might give a peasant for a thoughtful service. We have been scarce introduced. I am Utak, poet of the five schools, artist supreme, and I am willing to forgive your assault upon my form. The Drukari saw no response from the captors. I am willing to forgive you, he repeated, adding as much silver persuasion as he could. The water pinned him against the wall again. They held him there, writhing helplessly for what felt like eternity, until the door closed. Utak flung himself at the door. Let me out, he cried. Silence. They kept him there for another day as he cried and bellowed on the door. The next time they came, he would be ready. Utak heard their approach through the stillness of the ship. This time he stood to the side of the door. This time he would not be humiliated. The door slid open and he waited, remaining pressed against the wall. He waited longer. Let one enter, then he would render upon its flesh punishment only a dracon could inflict upon a mortal. The door slid shut. Utak threw himself at the door. No, no, come back, come back! Through his cries he could hear footsteps leaving him alone in his terrible solitude again. When next they came, Utak waited clearly visible in the cell as the door opened, although his eyes were reduced to slits in anticipation of the oncoming onslaught. The water jet 
pinned him against the wall again. At least, this time he had closed his mouth, but it was harder to seal his nose. The water pushed up into his nostrils, choking him and forcing coughs that opened his mouth to more water. The water jet stopped. The door slid shut. Utak screamed as he heard them walking away. He screamed as the sound disappeared into the silence. He screamed at the silence, then into the silence, against the silence, but the silence swallowed his voice and returned nothing back. His screams eventually died away. In the silence, the awful, overpowering silence, Utak, Dracon of the Cabal of the Pierced Rose, began to talk to himself, mumbling songs, poems, and fragments of forgotten lullabies from the deep past. This humiliation continued to the point that Utak considered self-slaughter, but he had no tools to perform the act. His own razor-sharp nails had been removed to bloody stumps. He had no choice but to endure, but then he had a great realization. They would come back to him. They must surely want something from him, for he still lived. He would give it to them, for in giving them what they wanted, he would find the key to their desires. Once he knew their desire, it would only be a matter of time before their heart would be resting in his hand. The next time they came, he stood in full view, not making a move or saying a word. Utak waited. They stood in silence, watching. Utak waited some more. Still, they remained silent, watching. His finger twitched, and they made no move and gave no answer. Utak inquired, aren't you going to say? The water cannon knocked him back onto the bulkhead. They pinned him there with the force of the water again for a minute before slamming the door shut once more. Utak had endured enough of this nonsense. By not torturing him, they were torturing him. He needed to feel excesses, he needed to feel joy and sorrow, ecstasy and pain, but there was no stimulation of any kind. Utak needed to feel something. Utak hit the floor, he hit the floor again, and again, and again, and again, until he reduced the bones in his fist to fragments, but at least he felt something. When next they came, he said nothing, cradling his injured hand. They looked at him as if he were a beast, impassive, dangerous, but nothing more than an animal. They waited and Utak waited on them, doing or saying nothing in fear of the water cannon. Then one pointed to the ground. He understood that they wanted him to lie down. The Drukhari acknowledged this and carefully followed the instruction, lying face down on the floor. Put your hands behind your back. The tone was uncouth, and the language coarse, but they were the first words that Utak had heard in an unbearable age of solitary suffering. Hot tears of joy sprang from his eyes as he hastened to follow the command. They tied his hands and marched him through the ship. 
Utak was initially relieved to see new surroundings until he realized that it was all the same, silent, blank, and boring. No music, no sounds, no views to enjoy of the ship as he explored it. He was appalled that they all lived like this. The Mong Kai pushed him up towards the higher levels of the ship and then threw a small bulkhead into a crystal dome atop the vessel. The dome itself was closed and the Mong Kai indicated towards a chair. He was then tied to the seat with shackles on his wrists and ankles and a collar around his neck. They must intend to interrogate him. Utak schooled his face to hide any form of satisfaction. It would be a simple matter to turn them against each other. It was only fitting given the indignities they had forced upon him. But as he watched the Mong Kai withdraw from the chamber and close the door behind him, he was confused. They were leaving him alone. Then he heard the mechanical sound of the dome opening. Initially, he was worried, scared. He felt a pang of fear course through his veins. Were they exposing him to the warp? Surely not. But his fear was quelled, seeing that it was too dark. They must have dropped out of the warp and back into real space. Utak settled back in his chair. There were far worse things than being left alone in a dark room looking at the stars. But as the shutters opened, he realized that there was nothing but darkness. No stars and no sounds. It was the void. There was no form of anything. There was nothing. Absolutely nothing. It was agony to have such deprivation of his myriad of senses. And because there was nothing to take in, there was no stimulation of any kind. Utak started to laugh, but his laugh slowly trailed away into the all-encompassing silence. Outside, as the hours passed, Tangata Manu and Te Karungi heard the silence give way to defiance, which then slowly trailed into a long quiet. Then the Dark Elder began to cry. They waited until the crying died back down to silence, and then they waited some more. Utak was now broken. So that was the area of the book that I enjoyed the most. I think that it was a fantastic way for them to be able to break a Dark Eldar, because as a race who basically is built upon stimulation and excess, it was torture to him to be starved of all of those senses and to be constantly stripped of any kind of interaction. And comparatively to so many other forms of media, it's so great to see that from Utak's own perspective. So I really enjoyed it and I hope that you all did as well. If you do want to see more content like this where I talk about interesting moments from the Warhammer lore, then make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe. But that is pretty much about it for today. So I've been Kiv, and I will see you all on the next one.